All right, folks, uh, welcome. It's always great to be here with you. And uh, at Market Rebellion, we're lucky enough to have a lot of great friends and a lot of really smart people that join us on these uh, Zoom calls and so forth. And one of those people is a great friend and uh, one of the brightest guys in the business. Uh, you've seen him on uh, television multiple times. He's been on the Halftime Report. He's been on uh, Fast Money. He is Mark Fisher. He was the largest clearing firm on the uh, New York Mercantile Exchange. He had traders all over the country, all over the world, and um, his uh, trading company as well backed some of the biggest traders in the business. And so he's, he kind of knows all things energy, folks. Beyond that, I mean, Mark trades virtually anything uh, almost 24 hours a day. If you think I'm manic, this guy is manic. <laughs> and he can't get enough of trading. And we're so lucky to have him here with us, folks. Just to give you just a little more of a build up, Mark, he is also good friends with people like Stevie Cohen. And he was involved with uh, Robin Hood. He still might be. We'll ask him about that. But that, that's one of the great charities from these folks on Wall Street, folks that uh, basically every year it raises tens of millions of dollars for needy people. And in addition to that, I happen to know that Mark is an active supporter of inner city schools in New York City, their athletic programs, their after school programs and all, this, all the rest. So pleasure to welcome in my friend, Mark Fish. How are you doing, Fish? Hey, John, just as a correction, I'm not really, I, I, I obviously know Stephen Cohn, I went to, he went to the same school as me, but he's not one. Of, I have I have not spoken to him, so I just wanted to correct you there. There are other people, but not him. Okay, but you are involved with uh, Robin yeah, yeah. Hood well, for we, years we, and years. I, I, we've been involved with Rob, but really, my my pride charity is we run the largest basketball program for the country in, for kids out in New York. We have uh, we've had out of our program called New York Lightning, Long Island Lightning, and our whole program over the last twenty years over five hundred, no more, six hundred kids go to school on Division One, Division Three scholarships. We've had 15 kids in the pros. We have 28 kids currently playing D1 basketball that would have been on TV if there was the NCAAs. And if you can't afford an NBA team, it's the next best thing to do. Yeah, well, and you might be able to afford an NBA uh, team uh, as well, Fish. <laughs> but anyway, but to, to let you know, we still run a large, a large proprietary trading group. We don't clear anymore. And I probably have slept in the past four weeks, maybe two and a half hours a day, because, you know, you know, the sleep, I don't know, John, sleeping is just overrated, to be honest with you. Anyway. <laughs> well, for you, it's overrated. For me, I love it, but I'm like you, I don't get nearly enough of it. Right. But I love it when I get it, Fish. Right. And I also love when, when you share some of this insight into uh, um, things like energy and, you know, psychology because I know you're pretty expert on both of those things. Well, well I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what I, I'll tell you just to jump right in what I think is there's two types, there's two types of investing slash trading. One is the short term, you know, 10 minute, one day, max two day trading, which is all about reacting. Mm -hmm. The other is long term investing, which is looking at six months, a year, two years down the line. And that's all, you know, forward thinking. And it's a whole different mindset. So the problem that most viewers have, most traders have, is they can't separate the two time slots. So it's really important to know what you're doing and why you're doing it. Are you trading because you know, you know, it's, it's trading for short term or long term and to keep those views separate. So what I would do is as a bucket, I would trade in one account, you know, your short term trading and another account, your long term trading and ask yourself, why are you making these trades so you don't mess up the buckets? So where we are in energy, I mean, we've, I've had so many, we've had so many people, I don't even know, what, if you called me up 26 times in a day, we would have 26 different short-term trades on, so, to, different total positions in energy. Sometimes I couldn't even keep track. But if you look at it and pay it forward for people who are investors, do you remember the, you remember the movie War Games with Matthew Broderick? I sure do, loved it. Okay. You remember with the computers, and, you know, they, and they almost started, you know, the nuclear destruction themselves, right? Yep. And then the computer stopped itself 
because it realized that there was no way to win. It was just mutual assured destruction, right? That's why and then it wanted to go back to playing chess. Right, <laughs> exactly. That's basically what's going to happen with OPEC, Russia, and the United States, okay? Because obviously you've had, you know, Russia and OPEC at each other's throats for various reasons. Well, some of it's political. Some of it involves, you know, the Middle East. You know, you know, it's, it involves much more than just oil. It involves, you know, cultures. It involves Yemen. It involves Iran. And it also involves the fact that they're all both, as much as they're pissed off each other, they're also pissed off that they're cutting and Shell just keeps producing. But in the long run, if you think about what's happened is here, Russia backs away from the table. So there's going to be no real agreement initially. Then Saudi Arabia says they're just going to mass produce, and the price goes from 45 to 20, right? Well, in the long term, just like in the movie War Games, that's mutually assured destruction. That can't last. Right. Cannot last. So like I said on TV, I said it may take a month or two, but eventually these prices are going to seem ridiculous, right? This, these things are going to have to work themselves out because nobody from Russia, Saudi, the Middle East, even the Shell can't, can't afford this entire thing. One of the big reasons why the high yield market has been such disarray is because of what's happened in energy, right? So I think what you're going to see happen is you're going to see a quasi meeting of the minds. I see OPEC just delayed their conference from Monday to Thursday, so they'll be more infighting. But eventually, you're going to eventually see the price of oil north of $40 again, especially Brent, which is not landlocked, right? And so you're going to get to uh, back to a number that's at least, you know, where the marginal rate of production is still, you know, has a positive return. Right, and the way to do that, if if I'm an, if I'm a, a trader, is is one of two ways. If you can trade every two minutes, like my guy's done, which will you might as well blow your brains out of your head, or you can go ahead and take a longer term view and saying, okay, well the gas prax, which is the difference between gasoline and crude oil and Brent, which is negative right now, can't stay negative more than another couple of months. So we've been buying out on the board December 21, December 22 gasoline prax. And for those of you that, that that's too complicated for, I still think, and John, you know better than me, the most widely held stock in the UK is British Petroleum. There is no way in my mind that the UK government is letting British Petroleum go down the tubes because every single pension fund, every single person there owns that stock. So, you know, you know if you buy energy, you want to hold it, but then you have the problem of you know, the contango and having to roll it forward and the price of energy can rise, but because of the contango, you may end up not making any money. But British Petroleum, you know, we've rode it from 25 down to 15, back to 25. And, you know, to me, okay, the international big oils like, you know, that can survive these short-term cash crunches, you know, probably are the way to play, you know, to invest in oil. That's what I would think. All right, well, let me get into some slides with you. Quick disclaimer that Fish and I are discussing this, and this is for educational and informational purposes only. You guys want to trade it. That's your business, but we're not your financial advisors. Because I love you, Fish, I put up a, a little thing about the New York Lightning. Um, you know, and as he said, also Long Island Lightning, right, Fish? New York Lightning, Long Island Lightning. We used to have a Miami program. You know, we, we have, we, we've had a lot of good stories there. Yep. Fantastic. And then here's the big slide, folks, that, uh, you know, basically yesterday they were talking about, hey, could Brent crude drop to $10 a barrel? Um, first of all, Fish, I'm not even asking you that question. I'm just saying CNBC put this one up yesterday. When people talk about storage, let's talk just for a second about storage and how you have addressed it throughout your career, as well as contango. Because when you've got crazy things uh, going on in the world, you know, we get contango in options and in uh, uh, the VIX all the time when, when all of a sudden crap hits the fan. How about in this market, in your market, in the energy space? Well, that's exactly why it's really difficult to, take, to trade on, on a more than a day-by-day -day view to trade futures to call the position just because of contango. You know, the differential between the spot crude oil in WTI and the next month is $2 already. And again, because WTI is a landlocked delivery point in Cushing, okay, you know, if you, what's happened in the past is you've had landlocked prices 
in Canada go to $5 a barrel. You've had natural gas at certain points in locations where they couldn't get the gas out go negative. And that's why I think that Brent at $10, you know, where it's a seaborne um, energy uh, commodity where it can be, it's not landlocked and where it can be held on vessels. It's going to be really tough to get that price down to $10 unless there's complete demand destruction beyond even what we see now. And um, I, I, I don't see Brent going to $10. WTI in a, you know, if, you know, if there was three waves of the pandemic, maybe could it go to Yes. But, you know, Brent, I don't think so. But again, high price, low prices beget lower supply, beget um, less supply, we get higher prices, and it's, and it's a revolving wheel. I think even when you think about where we're gonna be, not today, but six months from now, we're basically, by cutting off all this shale production in the States, that once you cut it off, it's not like you can just flick, flick the switch and turn it back on. I think that the energy companies that can survive, the ones that don't have the debt, not the Whiting Petroleums that have you know, basically filed for bankruptcy, are gonna be in a much stronger position you know, coming out of this six months a year from now. And that's why Shell, BP, you know, you know, the Exxons, those companies was where if, you know, where I place a bet on as opposed to just buying front month, you know, crude oil, which, go, you know, which yesterday was up $4 and the day before was, you know, had a you know, $6 range. But I would also think that because, John, of what you're saying, you know, what you're saying here about, I'm talking about, about storage and how we could run out of storage space in the near term in WTI, I think that being long Brent crude and short WTI crude, that spread, which is currently you know two dollars, three dollars, could go easily go out to twelve dollars if things get really crazy. I think that Brent crude is you know is is not going to go to the levels that you know, this headline says. But in a crazy world, could WTI go to that levels? Yeah, probably. Cool. I'm just making note. Um, all right. Uh, this is a graph, folks, uh, that uh, Mark lives every day. But as you see, beginning of this year, crude oil was over $60 a barrel. Um, crude oil, of course, when MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, decided to just get into this ludicrous um, mutually assured destruction that Mark referenced with his, uh, uh, oh, that um, Matthew Broderick movie at the beginning of our discussion here, war games, um, you see it falling off a cliff there. Um, and it fell all the way down, all the way into April when finally Trump said, I'm going to have a conversation with Putin and MBS. Mark, when he said that, and crude oil was 19 and change uh, when that news broke, what did your traders do? How did you guys respond to that? I think we all lost money. <laughs> I think we're all, you know, but again, my God, our team is pretty adept at, you know, we do well when there's volatility. And again, there's been so much volatility, so you can't go by what we do. But for, the, but for people who are looking for a, 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 you know, education, okay, obviously a, a dramatic move from $20 a spot to $28 a spot, you know, whether you believe that Trump is able to pull this off or not, markets don't go to $8, move up $8 and stay there for no reason. Now, Okay, if this if this OPEC crisis doesn't get solved in this week, can the market back go back and revisit twenty dollars? Yes, and that's why energy futures are a tough thing to you know to navigate, and that's why I I, I think that buying the the big in, you know um, energy names, the international ones, where you're not only buying their production and they're buying their exploration, but you're also buying their refinery cap capacity. Because remember. Even in fifteen dollar oil, this, you know, there's margins to be made on refining it into into refined products. So I think, again, to reiterate, BP, Exxon, Shell, Chevron is where I would be placing my bets, as opposed to, you know, following this energy craziness, which is you know, you know, next to impossible to follow. There's a, a one month look, folks, as it fell from. 47 and a half um, on that failed meeting uh, to get a, an agreement with the Russians. I mean, it couldn't have come at a worse time, Mark, for the market, really, because um, even though it's good for Americans to drive, you know, they think of, oh, well, 
prices at the pump are coming down. It's bad for jobs in America. Um, it's bad because we've had such a cutback from airlines, from uh, ships already uh, that have cut back on supplies, uh, it, many supplies, not all, of course. There's still a lot of stuff moving across the ocean. But as far as commercial aviation, it's virtually ground to a halt. Well, the, um, interesting, the interesting thing about that, John, is that, number one, people typically view a, the decline in crude prices as a tax cut, right? Mm -hmm. Think about it, right? But yep. it's not really a tax cut when no one's driving, <laughs> okay? Right. If, if, if demand is kept by so much, how much of, of a cut is this? Obviously, when demand is strong is when you lower that, when lower prices actually, you know, create, you know, a stimulus for a tax, you know, for like a, a, a quasi tax cut. But here, everyone suffers, okay? Uh, Texas suffers, you know, all the producing states suffers, well, you know, with shut-ins and lack of employment, lack of jobs. Saudi Arabia suffers. Because obviously, you know, I don't care, even though they're the lowest cost per hour production, their budget for what they're trying to do in their country doesn't allow crude oil to stay, you know, at these levels. Russia can't produce at these levels. The ruble's getting destroyed, right? And even, you know, even all these, you know, stalwarts in Russia, you know, who are basically, you know, never really wanted these cuts are realizing that this can't, again, this is just a case of mutual, mutual destruction. Now, mutual. how about uh, the other side of energy, Mark? the natural gas, um, would you say, would you take a shot? And let's take the pipelines and natural gas. Would you take a look at either of those two? Or are, are, well, are the you? Thing, the interesting thing is the front of the board of natural gas, is, which is like in the 150s, is reflecting the fact of, you know, there's no demand, that everything's shut down, right? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, people are thinking that this winter, because of all these shut-ins, and because of all this associated uh, shell that's not going to be produced, and because there's not this associated gas that's going to get burnt, that it gets produced when all this crude production comes in, the January contract is staying in the two, mid, you know, low twos and, and doesn't go down because everyone's afraid what's going to happen this winter. Can you imagine, John, that after all this craziness with, you know, oversupply of, you know, of energy, that we have a really cold winter and because of the fact that there have been so much shut-ins in terms of natural gas production, that the price of natural gas goes to $5, right? You know, crazy things can be said. It's, it's sort of like, it's sort of like where we, we end up fighting the balance of today and thinking about what the repercussions are for the next, you know, next winter. So I think that natural gas is an interesting thing. You're seeing companies going broke, which is good. You're not seeing private equity put more money in just to fund these companies, you know, and to, just to produce. I think they're all getting religious when it comes to, you know, CapEx. And so I think that natural gas, you know, is it going to be this year? Yeah, maybe. Is it going to be next year? Probably. You know, I think that, you know, you, 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 you know the front of the, remember, the front of the board doesn't, re doesn't really represent what these natural gas companies rely on because the front of the board is not where they hedge. They're hedging out, you know, six months, a year, two years, three years down the line. Does Chesapeake go out of business? Maybe. Okay. Does, do some of these other ones go out of business? Yes. But I think that you're going to see a resurgence of natural gas for another reason that people don't realize. One of the things that I think is going to come out of this entire um, crisis is that the foreign supply chains to the United States have been permanently ruptured. And people don't trust these supply chains anymore. So all these supply chains that are in the Far East, that are in, you know, Europe, that are in different countries, are going to come back to the United States. People are going to want to go ahead and make sure that your supply chain is in your own country. So you're going to have a lot more, a lot less globalization, and a lot more, you know, you know, domestic, you know, production consumption. With that, the only way we're going to be able to build the supply chain throughout this country for materials is if you're going to increase the use of natural gas dramatically. No other way. It, it, it has to. There's no other way to get it done. All right. Um, last about those stocks, Kinder Morgan or any of the pipeline companies um, interested there or just because they're a transportation mechanism um, and they're just taking a toll every time they deliver or, or would I, you I, stay I, away? I, 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 I have no idea because I'm no an expert in those companies. Mm -hmm. And I think that really comes down to which of those companies, you know, that if you, if I'm on, you know, if I'm on the, if I have, you know, 
if I have, you know, contracts with these, you know, with other companies that have to take or pay, you know, make or take on, you know, on, on my pipeline, you know, I don't know how many of those pipelines have exposure to the companies that are going to go bankrupt. Because once you go bankrupt, you know, their contracts null and void. So, you know, you need someone that's far more, you know, in tune with that and far more astute than me to come to, the, to make a decision about those companies. Oh, I don't know if we can find somebody far more astute than you, Mark. Okay. But all right, let me let let's switch it up just a little bit and talk about you created this group of stocks called the Essential Forty, and um, I know that Jeff Kilberg runs that um, with uh, you know the group uh, basically trying to achieve the goal that you set out, saying, "Hey, here's forty stocks." that people use every day. It touches their lives in one way or another virtually every day. So it's a, it's a very different sort of an ETF, but it's also something that people have sort of been gravitating to more and more since you launched it. Was it 2017 or 2016, Mark? I, time flies. I don't really remember. Uh -huh. but, but, but the way that, the way it works is, first of all, I'm the, my firm is the index creator. Yeah. And we license this to Jeff, so I can't talk about what Jeff does. I know he runs a mutual fund around it, but I can just talk about the index. And the, and the thing that I can tell you about it from doing prior projects, like we had, I, I, I initially launched the, um, the, um, uh, the on off, on off with Dennis Gartman. Yeah. And I also, and I also launched with, um, on the CME, I had the, uh, movie, uh, backwardation contango index and, and straight line, uh, futures. But what I found with, with all those products in the past, they were too hard to understand. And because they were too hard to understand, they, those indexes that, you know, attracted initial success, but eventually petered out. Here, okay, what we have is created an index that rebalances every year back to two and a half percent over 40 stocks. And this index basically, basically, so every year you're throwing out your, part of your winners and adding to your losers, right? And, we only, and it only gets rebalanced once a year, assuming there are no extraordinary events. And to me, it's basically 40 names of companies that represent different industries. And there's obviously some reason why they're formatted the way they are. But what it comes down to is these are essential to the way you live. Like not, you're like too big to fail. These are too essential to fail. And in times like this, again, you know, the comparison between us is probably where, you know, the comparison between any other equally weighted index, because, you know, the S&P is not really an equally, equally weighted index. Neither is the Dow, neither is the NASDAQ. But we're an equally weighted in index. And basically it comes down to names that your, your life is materially, how should I say, screwed. If, if, if one of these companies go in there. For instance, if today in the middle of this crisis, J.P. Morgan was to have a hiccup, forget about it, right? If Microsoft, ExxonMobil, okay, Amazon, uh, Waste Management, um, if these companies were, you know, if these companies were, were to have, you know, to have a, uh, uh, a hiccup. We all rely on these every day for the way we live. We rely on these companies, Verizon. Okay, think about what would happen today, John, if there was a material hiccup with Verizon. Right? Forget about it. So, in terms of that, that's why I believe that in times of going forward, people are going to invest in what they need, and people are going to invest in what they know. And the days of investing in all these, you know pie in the sky ideas and where the growth is going to be and a future multiple based on a WeWorks constantization of, you know, 500 times, you know, future earnings, that's all going away. Well, um, I, I think this is something that you guys should take a look at folks, the essential 40, because, um, you know, just like Mark said, uh, you know, assets under management, it's somewhere, you know, north of 35 million. Maybe it's more than that. As he said, Jeff, uh, Gilbert runs a mutual fund around that as well. And when you're looking at these, at the stocks in here, you know, uh, just give you a quick rundown. This is 30% of what the fund holds. Apple is almost 4%. Microsoft, Costco, Lockheed, Facebook, Visa, JP Morgan, ADP, uh, Cisco, not the Cisco, the router company, but Cisco, the food delivery company, General Electric. Again, these are all stocks that touch us one way or another um, virtually every day. So I think it's a very interesting, especially, Mark, as we start to come out of this, because we all know certain stocks like Clorox and like Zoom 
um, and maybe like some of these biotechs and so forth, Gilead, Moderna, things like that, have really been focused stocks for people right now. But as they come out and as they're able to go back into stores, not just ordering online and things, all of those stocks that I just named, as well as the other 30 stocks in the portfolio, are things that people touch or interact with virtually every day. Well, the thing about the thing about that, to your point, John, is it's not just you know again, it's not just earnings, but what people are willing to pay for a multiple of those earnings. And I think what's going to happen is going forward, people are people really going to be paying the multiples of earnings that they were willing to pay before this pandemic? Don't think so. I think earnings and stability of earnings and and what industries you're in and stability of those you know stability of those of of those industries is what's going to become more and more important to investors. But again, I could be dead wrong. I've been, I've been wrong in the past. I'll be, I'll be, I'm dead wrong every day. I love being wrong because that means when you're wrong, it, you, you need to learn more. You learn to be humble and you know you don't know everything. You know? So I know I have a big sign in my office. You know, you know, I, I don't know if you remember, were you ever a fan of you know, Hogan's Heroes, John? Oh, yeah. You remember Sergeant Schultz? He knows nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> right. Well, being humble is a great thing. Um, you know, some of us have to put on the bravado. Mark, you almost never do. I've never really seen you putting on, you know, uh, bravado about what a great trade you did, what a fantastic company you built. But you've done all those things. You've made fantastic trades that most people could only dream of. Um, you've built wonderful businesses. And I just really appreciate you sharing a few minutes with us on a Saturday so that we can get, you know, some thoughts about energy out to the world from a guy who's boots on the ground in energy every single day, 24 seven, virtually. Right. Well, anyway, John, thanks for the time. And uh, I got to go chase my four year old around before he destroys the rest of my house. All right, Mark, thank you very much, sir. Folks, that's Mark Fisher, MBF. Uh, MBF is his trading company, as he said, proprietary trading, as well as um, he is an advisor to and a creator of the Essential 40, which is that uh, ETF we spoke of that my friend Jeff Kilberg um, manages and runs a mutual fund around that. So just wanted you guys to be aware, and I wanted to thank you for joining us, and I hope you took some notes. I did, uh, because whenever Mark Fisher is telling you what's going on in energy, it's valuable. It's not just energy, but anything. So with that said, folks, Thank you. Please tell your friends about the, uh, uh, the Zoom videos and the podcasts, and we'll see you back here with Market Rebellion on Monday.